Hello. Welcome to Trinity Presbyterian Church. We have some exciting news for you, some events that are coming our way. The stewardship team is hosting a celebration right here on our campus. And this event is on October 7th, so mark your calendar. We begin at 5 p.m. and we will be sharing in a good news celebration. So come on out and join us for an evening of complimentary food and entertainment. Don't forget, bring your chairs and bring your masks. Come and enjoy fellowship. And now let us center our hearts and our minds and gather together in unison from wherever it is that we are viewing this day. Let us join our hearts and be in the spirit of worship. Let us worship. God has called us here this day. We are here, although for some of us, it was not an easy choice. Often, what we say and what we do are very different. Help us follow God's will, not with lip service, but with true humility. Come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time of healing, restoration, and hope. Let us worship God. Too often, we tell God we will do better and be better, and then we just go on living the same way we always have. It takes us so long to realize that we cannot heal ourselves or turn ourselves into better people on our own strength. Let this be the moment when we admit to God and to ourselves our failures and faithlessness so that we can go forth to be forgiven and healed and strengthened to work in God's kingdom of grace and hope. Join me as we pray. 
God of patience, your people grow weary. We complain and question. We put you to the test. Our mouths say yes, but our deeds say no. When we wander off your path, when we fail to follow through on our good intentions, when we give our attention to trivial things, gently call us back to you. Empty our hearts of anger and pride. Empty our souls of greed and, selfless and selfishness. Empty our minds of envy, doubt, and mistrust. As you poured out your very self through your beloved son, pour your spirit into our hearts today. Forgive us our wrongdoing. Reclaim us with your love. Amen. God knows our hearts and our spirits. He sees our struggles and forgives our weakness. Know that it is in God's healing love that you live and move and have your being. We rejoice for God is with us always. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let us worship God. book, Jesus and Money, author Ben Worthington reminds us of this. What is amazing about the teachings on tithing in the Old Testament is not that God demands a tithe, but that God does not demand it all back since it all belongs to God. Behold the graciousness and generosity of God who wants people to be able to have life and live it to the full. Not, however, at the expense of forgetting to whom we owe all we have. With that in mind, let us gather together our offerings in gratitude and in praise. Whether you put a check in an envelope or give through our website, aztrinityprez.org, your gifts are gratefully received. They are a blessing to our congregation. God of abundance, you fill us with good things. You satisfy our, our thirst. You meet our every need. From your rock, our blessings flow. Accept what we give in return. Our hearts, our hands, our gifts, our love. Use them to answer the cries of a world in desperate need. In Jesus' name, amen.
Great are you, Lord our Father, most worthy of our praise. We sing your righteousness forever and ever. Gracious and compassionate, so to anger rich in love, faithful to your promises, and loving to all you have made. Your saints will sing for joy. We now hear the parable found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 20, beginning at the first verse and continuing on through verse 16. And this is a very familiar parable of the gracious vineyard owner who seeks employees all the day long, paying them equally. Hear now the word of our Lord. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, 
These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Surprising God, may your joy overwhelm us this day. May your abundance sweep away our preconceptions of what it means to be your people. May your justice prevail. Fill our hearts and fill our minds with your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and redeemer. Amen. You have made them equal to us. You have given them dignity, bemoan the early to work, those who were first in line. In our parable of the generous landowner, a landowner goes out several times all throughout the course of the day to hire laborers to work in his vineyard. And when that long, hard work day is at last and finally over, the landowner pays every worker the exact same rate, the same wage. Huh, declare the laborers who started work at the crack of dawn. They look at one another and they begin to commiserate. They begin to build their case against the one who has just paid them. And then they let their complaint be known. They say, these last workers were here for only one hour, whereas we have been here all day long with the burdensome heat of the sun pounding down on our shoulders. And here you go and you make them equal to us. What is this scandal? They demand to know. And so in response, the landowner deflects this accusation, their accusations with a question. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I'm generous? The author of the book, Reading Jesus, Mary Gordon, helps us to hear with really painful candor what their follow-up response to the landowner's question might have been. She says, it might have been something like this. Yeah, I am envious because you're generous. I'm envious because my work, my work has not been rewarded. I'm envious because somebody else has gotten away with something. Envy has eaten out my heart. After all, fair is fair, equal pay, equal work, equal pay for unequal work, mm, not so much. And yet the landowner in Jesus' story does not judge his workers by the length of hours that they have put in. What, he, what seems to concern him is that the very last person, every single person in that market, marketplace, finds a spot to work in his vineyard. From the early bird to the latecomer, the able-bodied and the infirm, the young and the old, the popular and the forgotten. And so it is that at the end of the day, what concerns the landowner is not who deserves what. Now partnered with this parable, we have the story of Jonah, the reluctant prophet. I love Jonah. Jonah is asked to be a messenger on behalf of God to go to the people of Nineveh. The book of Jonah opens 
saying, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh and preach forgiveness to the people. And well, as we all know, as we are familiar with his story, he promptly takes off in the opposite direction. <laughs> Instead of heading east, he goes and he heads west. And on his journey, he spends some time on board of a boat, and then he spends some time inside of a great fish because he gets thrown overboard. But so now, as we see from his excursion, from taking off in the other direction, Jonah had no interest in going to Nineveh. And perhaps that is because they were some of Israel's most violent and despised enemies. They were known for their fierceness, for their, their level of cruelty in battle. They were known for sweeping through villages and killing everything, everyone in their path, even infants and children. And so if we were to flip back to Nahum chapter 2, we would discover their notes which speak of just what the Israelites thought of them. They sought the destruction of the Ninevites. That's what they thought of them. So we can understand Jonah held no interest in preaching to this city of people. Their well-being was the least of his concerns. Jonah was a very reluctant prophet, indeed. And yet his journey, as far away as he tried to go, still brought him right back, right there to the city gates of Nineveh. So when he hears again from the Lord saying, get up, Go to the great city of Nineveh. Reluctantly, he goes. But only just barely. Just barely does he go actually into the streets of the city. For it is just beyond the city gates that he stops and he calls out, Just 40 days and Nineveh will be no more. Great. And with that, he retreats. And he sits himself down in a huff underneath this little shelter that he built for himself just outside of those city gates. I can just see him. I can see him sitting there with his arms wrapped around his knees and his cheeks all rouged red with anger. Puffed cheeks, lips pursed. Now, a short time goes by and... Jonah finally says why it is that he is so angry. He is angry because he knows God's character. And he has known it all along from that very first time that he heard God telling him to go to Nineveh. And so he says to God, that's why I fled. That's why I fled to Tarshish from the very beginning because I knew that you, my God, are gracious and merciful. You are slow to anger and you abound in steadfast love. You are always ready to relent from punishing. So mumble, 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 mumble. What I really wanted was for the disaster that was going to come down on them to actually happen. <laughs> Mumble, mumble, mumble. In essence, what it is that make what is it that makes Jonah angry? God's mercy being shown to those who he did not feel deserved it. That's what it is that displeased him. What Jonah wanted was a God who punishes, a God who shows God's wrath. And what he got was a God who shows mercy. When things don't seem fair, like 
an inequality of hours to wages, as we see in our parable, or when we see this gracious forgiveness given and extended to those who are violent and downright wicked, as found in the city of Nineveh, we can get upset and we can get angry at the injustice of it. And right about now, there are many things about life that just are not really feeling very fair. Things are happening in a, in a succession that is exhausting. We have been catapulted into a season politically, socially, you name it. A season that is upsetting the apple cart. And it is at every level felt even down to our changing climate. Because right now, we watch in disbelief as people living in neighboring states are living in lockdown, and not just because of COVID-19, but because their air quality is so polluted from the magnitude of the wildfires that are raging that it's actually unsafe for them to leave their homes. All around our globe, there are long shadows of injustice and imbalances. And it seems that when these long shadows reach us, when life gets egregiously unfair, that little desire to be like Jonah can creep in. Either run, run as fast as you can in the opposite direction, because surely something better and more just is waiting for you. Or sit and stew, right? It's that freeze, flee, or that fight instinct that kicks in. In the face of injustices, it can be enticing to pull up a seat under the shade of a tree, just like Jonah, in order to sit and stew, or maybe like our first workers of the day, to lash out and complain. And we often look at these narratives from the side of those first in that field, those who entered at the crack of dawn, or from Jonah's perspective. But what if we were to look at them from the other side? Today's parable reads very differently in that respect. If we are the ones situated at the end of the line, the last ones to be chosen and hired, the workers who got more than they expected, think about them. They were ecstatic at the end of their work day, ecstatic, stunned, thrilled, so grateful. And how about those Ninevites? Their experience was one of utter sheer blessing, forgiveness, and a new life, a new start. God cares for the first and for the last. God is willing to walk with the Ninevites. There is opportunity and there is an invitation to step into a new identity a journey that echoes that of our ancestors as they were on their way to Mount Sinai. We know their narrative, don't we? We have often journeyed with them, moving through the uncomfortable space between uh, departure and destination, between liberation and covenant. The Israelites is a journey that is not just about wandering, but movement from enslavement to freedom, with freedom being not just about the absence of oppression or servitude, but about that which brings about a new understanding of self, a new sense of who am I and how am I seen by others. Theirs is a journey of becoming a new nation, grounded in a new knowledge of a God who is liberating and life-giving. At the end of the day, God provides manna. The God who is patient, 
commits to offering regular rations of sustenance, which can and do take place in the most adverse and unexpected of places. A gem which can easily be overlooked in this narrative as we focus on Jonah and his behaviors is that playful character of God. Because notice when you reread the book of Jonah and Jonah's story, God does not go and scold Jonah for his anger, but he playfully attempts to broaden Jonah's horizons in the hopes that the grumpy old prophet will eventually learn to see the Ninevites as God sees them. For yeah, while the Assyrians are everything which Jonah believes them to be, they are also so much more. They are a great city, God says, but they don't know their right hand from their left, which to say it in another way is to say they're human beings made in God's image, but they're lost and they're broken. So what they deserve is neither here nor there. What they need is compassion and God provides. With gentleness and patience, God demonstrates through this exchange with Jonah, God's continued focus on restorative justice. Every station and every standard that we often operate under called for the elimination of Nineveh. That is all but one, says Associate Dean of Doctoral Studies at Memphis Theological Seminary. He says the law called for it. Prudence called for it. Morality called for it. Political economy called for it. Survival of the fittest called for it. But there was one who saw something different, something more, something far more precious. The God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, the God of mercy and grace saw. God holds out for the heart and feeds the soul. And today I would like to close out and leave you with the words that I saw posted actually just this morning by a friend, the words of John O'Donohue. The soul needs love as urgently as the body needs air. In the warmth of love, the soul can be itself. Love is the nature of the soul. When we love, and allow ourselves to be loved, we begin more and more to inhabit the kingdom of the eternal. Fear changes into courage, emptiness becomes plenitude, and distance becomes intimacy. May God add to our understanding and bless us with his peace. Amen. Please join me in our confession of faith. We believe there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, for we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to God's purpose. We are convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Let us pray. Transform us, O oh Lord, by the renewing of our minds so that we abide in your ways and do not conform to the ways of the world. Teach us in the desert to trust you to provide. Free us from the panic that makes, our, makes us envious of others. May we delight in what you have given others so that we might experience your shalom, your peace in sharing the contentment that comes when all rest under their own vine and fig tree. We pray this day for healing for the wee ones born into these strange and foreign times, those born with challenges that many others will never know. Bless them and strengthen them for life's journey and bless their families with the knowledge of your presence and sustenance providing for their every step. We pray this day for all who are feeling the hollowness of loss. Fill their hearts with your love that they may know your peace. We pray for our nation, our community, our friends and our neighbors, those we know and those we may never have the privilege of meeting. May we abide together in your peace. We pray these things, these petitions, sharing in unison voice the words of our Lord and Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now go forth and labor in God's vineyard with gratitude in your hearts, rejoicing that all who are called, whether early or late in the day, will share in equal measure. Go in God's peace this day. Amen. Oh,